Okay, good evening, uh, my brothers and sisters in Africa. We are uh, two days after Easter Sunday, and Easter Sunday, of course, is the uh, a day that we celebrate our resurrected Christ. And basically, Easter message is uh, there is no more death. The death has been abolished. Death has been destroyed. Death has been seized by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I just tell you, if Jesus is resurrected without knowing death, what does that mean? Two things, okay? Number one, because he conquered death, and resurrected, which means he doesn't know, there is no more death. He's eternal God. That's what it means. Resurrection is the central message of Christianity. Resurrection is not something you preach uh, on Easter Sunday, but resurrection is the uh, something you need to preach every Sunday. Because we do not worship God who's dead, who died and was raised. Okay, so he's eternal and he has overcome the power of sin and death, which means he is powerful, omnipotent, almighty God. That's who Jesus is. And now he's alive. That's why he's coming back. The gospel does not stop at, at the cross, but it continues to resurrection and his kingship and reigning and him coming back to judge the living and the dead. That is the gospel. Is that the gospel that we see in the Bible? Yes, that's what we see in the Bible. So you do not want to talk about Prosperity, that's garbage. You don't want to stop at the cross because that's not where it ends. It continues to resurrection and his ascension and his coronation as a king. Now he's reigning the universe and history. And in due time, he's coming back to finish and to consummate and bring an end and bring a judgment and take his people to eternity. And then, of course, there is a judgment for all the all those people who has refused the gospel. And that's an expression that's in the Bible. In 1 Peter, either you receive the gospel and submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, Christ or you refuse the gospel and you rebel against him. And those who rebel against him, with along with Satan, along with Hades and death, he'll be thrown into the lake of fire. That's the resurrection message. So we have absolute living hope. There is no more death. Could you think about that? Death has been abolished. That's why Jesus said, if you believe in me, you will never die. What do you think Jesus' Jesus' claim is? Because he's alive after the resurrection, what he has taught and claimed, everything is true. Can you imagine? Jesus said, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna uh, suffer and I'm gonna die, and then I'm gonna be raised. And then when he died, he never wait, uh, he he never was raised. Can you imagine? Then he becomes such a liar. And whole Christianity and his teaching is nonsense and garbage. But because he was resurrected, because he's God, all his teaching and all that is claimed is true. It's the truth. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. Yes, we may physically die, but we will be with the Lord. Momentarily, we'll be with the Lord in the twinkling of an eye. And then he said, and if you live and believe, 
you will never die. And he will never die. Christ will never die because he has conquered death. He has abolished death. And he has ceased death anymore. There is no more death for Christ and for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's an amazing gospel. No other religion could claim that. Muhammad is dead. Buddha is dead. And Joseph Smith of uh, Jehovah's uh, Mormons, he's dead. And Muni is dead. Everyone dies. Okay? But Christ died and he was raised that knows no death. That's the resurrection message. And we have a message to tell the world. Because if you believe in Christ, you will never die. Amen? <laughs> Praise be to God. You know, uh, not only we preach Christ crucified, but we preach Christ resurrected and him coming back. If Christ is coming back, and if, he's, if Christ is coming back soon, would things be different? Of course. People who try to be greedy in this world, people who try to avenge someone who has hurted me and I want to avenge him, it, it's it's meaningless thing. If Christ is coming back, and if Christ is coming back soon, you will live differently. And that's what the gospel does. Okay? So today, uh, I want to pick up Galatians chapter 4. We are in the very core of the gospel of Galatians. And the gospel of Galatians, the main theme is the justification by faith or the truth of the gospel. Which means, starting from the beginning, all the way from the beginning, uh, be even before Genesis, starting from Abraham, salvation was always by God's grace, God's promise, through faith, by faith. And it was never works, it was never human tries, never human achievement, but salvation is God choosing his people, God pouring grace upon them, God giving faith to them, and he makes promise to them, and he fulfills all the way from Abraham to Moses, Jesus, Martin Luther, and all the way to now and until he returns. Okay? Salvation is always by grace. And we see that in the Galatians Gospel. And I gave you the timeline uh, last time. It's very important to have a good framework in your mind for be a good Bible teacher. If you don't have a big picture, you're always going to be lost in the in the woods, in the in the forest. Oh, that's a beautiful tree. Uh, that's a beautiful flower. And that's a beautiful bee. And that's a beautiful insect. And you talk about all these things, but you have to have a big picture of the forest, the entire scripture. It starts all the way from Abraham. 430 years later, the law was given through Moses. And another 1,500 years later, Christ actually came, fulfilling the promise. And then another 1,500 years went by, and then there was a reformation of Protestant church from the Catholic church. And another 500 years later, you are sitting in Ants, and I'm sitting in New York preaching the gospel. That's the big picture. And another, I don't know how many more years or days or 100 years, Christ will return and consummate and finish the entire history. And that's the timeline, but it doesn't matter where you live because God saved his people through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through grace, by grace, through faith in Christ alone. Okay? By grace, we were explaining it's uh, 
It's God making promises. I'm going to make you great. I'm going to give you your children more this uh, more than uh, the stars in the uh, in the sky. I'm going to name make your name great, and I'm going to make you be the blessing to the nations. Do you hear it? God is making a promise. I will do that. I will do that. I will do that. I will do that. 430 years later, the law says, you shall have no other God before me. You must not kill. You must not commit adultery. You must not covet. You must not give false testimony. So do you hear the difference? The, most, uh, the, the law says, you do it. You do it. You do it. But the gospel and the promise says, God says, I will do it. I will do it. I will do it. Very different. One is the gospel, Christianity. The other is religion, Judaism, and all the other religion. You need to preach this. Every other religion, you do it. You need to be a better person. You need to be a good person. You need to do good deeds. You need to do more. You need to go to God. No. Christianity says, I will do it. I have done it. I went to the cross for you. I give you faith. And I'm going to save you. It's God's religion. Okay? Now in chapter 4, we're continuing. Same thing. All the religion is slavery. You know slavery? Slavery is using other human beings as your tools. Very, very dehumanizing. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, slavery yes. is very, very dehumanizing. Whereas Christianity and the gospel is not slavery, but it's freedom and sonship. How different is a slave than a son? Very, very different. All the religion, if you want to do it by your own work, you are in slavery under the law. Slave. You are a slave. I was born as slave. Before I became a Christian, before I met the Lord, before I was born again, before I was regenerated, before the, the time has come, I live as a slave. I was born as slave. Slave to what? Slave to sin, slave to Satan, slave to the principles of this world. You're slave, okay? But when you are born again, you are no longer slave. Now you are a son. You are a daughter, children of God, okay? Do you see the difference? One is slave, one is son. And what is what makes the difference? Christ and you need to be born again and regenerated and you become a son. Becoming a Christian is a big difference than unbeliever. Unbeliever is a slave. Every human being in Africa, in continent of Africa, is born as slave. Every human being in America and New York is born as slave. Okay. Can we talk about slavery? I don't know how well you are aware of slavery, what you learn in school, but in American history, uh, we learn about slavery. Slavery is very, very evil. People who are created in the image of God and treating other people who are created, also created in the image of God, as their slaves, as their tools, as a labor force, and basically using them. That's very, very evil. Now, when you are a slave, what do you do every day? You work for your master. You live for your master. Do you like doing it? Probably not. A lot of times, it's a very hard work it's an evil work. 
and it's a bad work, you have to do it because you are a slave. You are a slave. You don't do it because you love to do it, but you do it because you are a slave to do it. What if you don't do what your master tells you to do? What happened to the slave? You get beat. Your master will beat you. Your bastard, master will hate you. Your master does not love you. Your master uses you. Your master slave you. Your master make you work for him, not for you. Your master will use you until you are no longer usable. And when you get sick and die, he will throw you away or he will sell you. That's slavery. That's slavery. And Bible says sin and religion, before you know Jesus, you are living in slavery. Pastor Hallelujah. Do you hear where yes, human um, beings are? Where yeah, human yeah. beings are? Before they become a Christian, they live as slaves. Yes. You know, people are addicted to sexual sin. I know that's prevalent in Africa too. In America, it's it's horrible. But sexual sin is in the Bible, all over the place. Sexual sin is extreme selfishness. You're using other women or other men even for your own flesh. That's what sexual sin is. You are using, you, are, you have no commitment toward that person and you have no true covenant love toward that person, but you want to have uh, just have sexual relationship so that it'll please your body, please your flesh. It'll please you which is very, very evil. That's why sexual sin is known as like one of the things that defines unbelievers. You do not want to live in sexual sin. You need to be set free from the slavery of sexual sin. Greed. And all that greed, you, want to, you just want to have more. You want to buy more. You want to use it more. You want to continue to have more. And it's, it's, what is that? It's all about your self-centeredness, which is a picture of what sin is. Sin is always extremely self-centered. It is not God-centered, but self-centered. You want to be focused. You want to have the attention. You want to have the control. You want to have the reign. You want to be the king of your life. That's what the sin is. You are slave to sin. You cannot help but to sin. When you're a slave, you have chain in your in your hands. Chain, right? You have chain. You're chained. And you you try to break it, you cannot break it. Someone has to break the chain for you. And Jesus on the cross, he broke the chain of sin and conquered sin and death forever. Forever. That's why you're no longer a slave. Now you are a son. Amen? Can I hear some wa uh, hands waving and say amen? Amen. amen. We're going to say amen to this. Amen. Uh, Jesus broke amen. the chain of sin. Broke the chain of sin. We are no longer slave to sin. Now we are sons and daughters of sin. Okay? Which is amazing truth. And with that, I'm going to read Galatians, okay? Now you listen. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. What am I saying is that as long as uh, an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave. Okay? Here we see the word slave. Before you actually become a son, in Greek culture, they are similar to slave that's what paul is explaining in this is a greek culture but it has a spiritual implication that until you become a true son you live as a slave okay so what i am saying is that as long as an heir is underage he is no different from a slave although 
he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. That's Greek culture. Okay. Guardians and trustees took care of children in Greek culture until father chooses who's going to be my heir. And he decides when the time comes. That's Greek culture. So in spiritual reality, until you actually become a son by by becoming, uh, uh, by regeneration and being born again, even though you may be a chosen person, but you live as, as a slave under the guardian, under the trustee of, of the law. Okay? So verse 3. So also when you were underage, we were in slavery under the element, elemental spiritual forces of the world until your mind is regenerated, until Holy Spirit lives in you. You are always full of, full of uh, things following the patterns and teachings of the world. Okay, because you are slave. Verse 4, but when the when the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. That's very, very important. How did we become a son? Through Jesus. And Jesus is explained this way. God sent his son. God missioned his son. And the son, the description of son is born of a woman, which is prophesied in Genesis. Jesus was born of a woman, fathered by the Holy Spirit, but, uh, uh, by, by the uh, Holy Spirit, uh, Mary uh, had his son uh, of Jesus. So only Jesus is born of woman, which means there is no lineage of, of sin. Okay. We read uh, in Apostles' Creed, uh, we believe in Jesus Christ who was born uh, a virgin birth of Mary, meaning he was uh, fathered by uh, God himself. And he was uh, birth through Holy Spirit. So born of a woman, born under the law. Jesus came as a human being under the law. Every slave, every human being is under the law. So he came to us, born under the law. So he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. He obeyed every single law of God as a human being, perfectly. He was sinless. For 33 years, Bible says, somehow, Jesus, because he is God, he was able to live without sin and obey the law perfectly. And that's who Jesus is. That's why he qualifies to, to go to the cross and die and pay for my sin and my pay for my uh, transgressions. Do you follow? So Jesus, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. That's you and I. Okay? We are under the law, which means if you break the Ugandan law, you, because you are under the law, you will be thrown into prison. If you steal things from a department store, if you're caught, you'll be thrown into prison because you're under the Ugandan law. Does that make sense? Now we are under the law of God. That's why Christ came so that he could pay the penalty of our transgressions and he's, and, and he's doing it on our behalf. So he came under the law to redeem us redeem those under the law, that we might become, uh, receive adoption to sonship. Two words I want to explain. Yeah, try to focus here. Try to focus here. The first word is redeem. What does that word mean? Redeem. 
It's a slavery word. In the Old Testament, there were slaves. You see that. In Israelites, there were slaves. And redemption or redeem is a slavery word. You go and pay the price and buy someone from slavery. Do you understand that? Let's say you need to go buy $10,000 to buy Pastor Hallelujah, who's a slave, and pay that price to the owner, and, and I buy him to set him free. That's to redeem. To purchase someone from the slavery to set him free. That's redemption or to redeem. It's a slavery word. The price that I pay, we call that ransom. Ransom. The word ransom and redeem is similar words in, in original word. The price that I pay to buy Pastor Alleluia from his slavery, we call that ransom. And by paying the price, setting uh, Pastor Alleluia from slavery, we call that redeeming Pastor Alleluia. Okay? Christ came to redeem us. How did he do that? By paying the price, by paying the ransom. What is the ransom that he paid? His blood, his death on the cross. Who did he pay that ransom to? To God, to God. Okay? That's what, what it says here. So when the time set had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, that's Jesus, who knew of no sin, okay? And born under the law to redeem those under the law, that's us, that we might become, we might receive adoption to sonship. Okay, so the other word that I want to explain is redeem, and the other one is adoption. Adoption is a very, very important word. In Greek culture, in the Bible culture, okay, father has a right to adopt, let's say, nephew or other people as my son. And he becomes the legal heir of my whole estate and family. And we call that adoption. In Greek culture, I don't know about in African culture, in Korean culture is a little bit different, but in Greek culture, adopted son has the full right of sonship. Full right of sonship. Full right of being an heir. And what, uh, what the gospel is saying here is that Christ redeemed us, not only from the slavery market, slavery, but he has adopted us as sons. That's the gospel. That's an amazing gospel if you think about it. You're a slave. Now you're a son. Did you think about that? You are, let's say you work for a, uh, a company. You are an employee. Important. But not that important. We could get another employee. No problem. But now, you're no longer an employee, but you are the president of the company. But more than that, now you are son of the uh, the president, which means you will own everything. So, using that as an illustration, now we are, we were slaves now we are adopted as sons. Okay? We are adopted as sons. That is amazing. That's an amazing gospel. So there is word redemption, and then there is adoption. When you become a son, okay, God, the Father, gives a seal. Uh, a, a, a evidence of that and that's Holy Spirit 
What kind of Holy Spirit? Spirit of adoption or spirit of sonship. Because we have spirit of God, who is the spirit of sonship, spirit of adoption, we know God is our father. So we call him Abba, Father. Abba, Father. When do you do that? The time. Because Romans chapter 8 says, Holy Spirit speaks to our spirit that we are his. We are his children. You are my beloved, and with you, I am well pleased. Holy Spirit always proves to our hearts that we are sons of God and daughters of God. So we could call him Abba, Father. That's the, that's, that's the gospel. From a slave to set free, from set free to be a son, and to a son, you become an heir. That's big difference. And that's what the gospel offers. That's the gospel of grace. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pretty amazing, if you think about it. That's what we are reading in Galatians. Do you follow? Okay. So verse 6, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls, you, calls out, Abba. Father. So you are no longer a slave. When you become a Christian, you are no longer a slave. Done! You are no longer a slave, but child of God. Since you are his child, and God has made you also an heir. What is an heir? Someone who will inherit everything of the Father. Okay, I, I, I explain up to verse 7. Uh, I want to take a little break, but I'll take a couple of questions if you have any questions before we take a little break. Anybody have a question up to now? No longer slave, but now I'm a son, a child of God. Pastor, hallelujah. Yes. Uh I have a question. Mm. We have talked about the slave. Slave. Mm -hmm. Now my question, my question is, Jesus brought us from slave after salvation, or we come from slave after belief in Jesus. Could you rephrase the question so I could understand? Uh, I'm asking, Jesus brought us from slave after salvation, mm -hmm. or we come out from slave after repentance? <laughs> I don't know the difference, but we were slave, but through Jesus, when you put your faith in Jesus, you become a child of God. You become an heir. You become a free person. So you need Jesus. We were slave. We were born as slave. Be before you became a true Christian, before you were born again, you were a slave. But through Jesus becoming my Lord, and you become a child of God. Does that make sense, Pastor? Hallelujah. Yes. yes yeah, that's yes. simple. It's simple. Don't think too too complicated. We were born as a slave to sin, to Satan. And when Christ came into our lives, when we are converted, when and we are regenerated, Holy Spirit uh, lives in us. Now we are a child of God. And it's going to continue to speak to us. You are my child. You are my beloved. With you, I am, you know, I'm well pleased. So we call God Abba Father. Yes, okay. Yes, yeah, you. think about it. Yes. Someone else? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is Nathan. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much for your teaching. I'm really enjoying. Mm. But this this ad adoption, mm -hmm. adoption, uh, mm -hmm. you brought it well, but uh, 
have not clearly picked it. So mm. I would like to sure to show me to make it yes. clear for me because I've liked the teaching so much. Okay. Adoption yeah. means yeah, personally, thank you. Adoption means taking someone who is not an actual natural birth son to be your son so that he will be an heir of your estate. I don't know African culture. In Korean culture, it's a little bit different. Adopted son is a little bit kind of feel like below the real son. But in Greek culture, in biblical culture, adopted son has a full right as a son. And oftentimes, I don't know about oftentimes, but sometimes uh, father decided to not to take weak son to be his heir, but he would take maybe a nephew, okay, another relative as the legal heir and adopt him as my son. And he has full right as a son and as an heir. And that's what the Bible context is. When God adopted us, we become co-heir with Christ. Heirs of God and co-heir with Christ. Who is the, the first son? It's Jesus. Jesus is the son. And now we become heirs, co-heirs, co-heirs with Christ. Brothers to Christ. Amazing gospel. So that's the biblical culture. And God is taking, uh, not a friendly guy. We were enemy of God. We are haters of God. We were in slavery to sin. And he not only set us free, and he redeemed us, but he adopted us as sons of God. That's Christian gospel. And we will be heirs with Christ forever and ever. That is Christian gospel. Yeah. Let's take three minute break. Oh, only three minutes, okay? We'll be back in three minutes. Okay, welcome back. We want to start uh, the second half of the class. And starting from uh, verse 8 in chapter 4. So when you become a son through adoption and through redemption, when you are born as a baby, you grow and you mature, you get sanctified and you get transformed. And that's what we're going to see uh, in the latter half of the book, latter half of the chapter. Verse 8, okay, chapter 4, verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who, by nature, are not gods. So, in other words, you are idol worshippers, slave to sin. But now that you know God, or rather, are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Remember, Galatians uh, taught the gospel through Paul. But they want to go back to the law. That's what he's keep explaining not to do that. Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Right? Paul is kind of arguing with them. You are observing special days and mouth and seasons and ears. And he's saying, you shouldn't do these. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. You know what he's saying? I feel like I pour my life onto you as a as a preacher and as a pastor, as an apostle, but you're turning back to the slavery. I feel like I my effort was useless. At least he feels like that. Verse 12. So I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me. Uh, for I became like you. You did no uh you did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a 
trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What Paul is saying is when he first met them in Galatia, when he was on his uh, probably missionary journey, first missionary journey with Barnabas, and he went through the uh, region of Galatia and preached the gospel to these people, and church was planted. And I got sick, and you took care of me. So now he's talking a little bit like a pastor. Until now, very, very uh, sharp, strict apostle, but now he speaks, speaks like a pastor. Remember, I was sick, you welcomed me, and we... And you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me. Verse, uh, verse 15. When then is your blessing of... Where then is your blessing of me now? What happened? I could testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. You loved me. You show your love to me. What happened? Why are you turning to different gospel? Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? So he's kind of pleading with Galatians, right? Verse 17, those people are zealous to win you over. That's Judaizers, false teachers. They are zealous to take your souls and win you over. But for no good, what they want is to alienate you from us so that you might have zeal for them. Those are the false teachers. They want to separate you from the truth. They want to separate you from the church. Okay? It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good. And to be so always, not just when I am with you. My dear children. Like he speaks to uh, Galatian church as if he's talking as a father. As a pastor. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Okay. That's the goal of pastoral ministry. Pastor Tom, you never pastored uh, a church, right? It is like, it is like raising a family. You need to pour your life onto them until Christ is formed in your congregation members. And that's the expression that we see here. Until Christ is formed in you. Until Christ is evidence evident in you. Until Christ is clearly visible in someone's life. That's a hard work. You're going to pour your life. You're going to preach the truth. And you're going to be, have, be patient. And there is that expression of, of a pain of giving birth. You men don't know. I don't know that pain. Only women know what the pain of childbirth is. And it's kind of ex ex interesting that Paul is using that expression. And Jesus used that expression in John chapter 15, 14 too. I am going... Uh, like a woman who's ready to give, give a birth as he go to the cross. People always want to wander from the truth. People do not like to hear the truth. And you as a pastor, you as a preacher, you need to be a shepherd and pastor to them as if you're giving a birth until Christ is formed in them. And the most important thing the pastors need to do is feed them with the truth, not with the lies. Feed them with the truth, with the gospel, with the Bible, with the scripture. If you feed them prosperity, they will die, and you will die. You need to preach the scripture and Christ and resurrected Christ and him coming back. Otherwise, you are not preaching the gospel. Do you understand that? So that's what that's the kind of like uh now he's pleading to them. 
Now he corrected them all the way up to here. Now he's pleading to them. Remember, we met when I was sick. You took care of me. You loved me. And you would have given your eyes if you had to. Meaning you would give me anything if you had to. What happened to you? Why do you follow the false teachers now? All they want is you. They want you to be zealous and to alienate you, separate you from the church, from us. Don't follow them. Right? That's what... Uh, Paul is saying, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Verse 20, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. I'm so worried about you. I want you to come back to the gospel. Do you hear Paul? Do you hear God? This is really God speaking to them. This is really God speaking to them. This is, it's Paul, but this is God's heart. Why I? Why are you running away from me? I have redeemed you. I have adopted you. Now you're my children. Now you're now. Now why do you want to follow this false gospel? Okay. Verse twenty-one. Tell me. You who want to be under the law, so going back to the religion, are you not aware that what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons. You know Abraham had two sons. Who are they? Ishmael, Ishmael, Ishmael and, and Isaac. Isaac. Right, right. Two sons. One by the slave woman. That's Ishmael through Hagar. Mm -hmm. And the other by the free woman. That's Isaac by Sarah. Right. Mm -hmm. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh. Do you remember? It was Sarah's impatience. God was going to give him a child. But Sarah came up with this idea. It's been 10 years. There's no child. So he, she sent Hagar, her, uh, her slave, with Abraham. And through that flesh wisdom, Ishmael was born, who contempted the true son Isaac, not only in the Bible, but until now, throughout history. Ishmael is the father of all the Arabs. And Isaac is the father of Israel. They are still fighting after 2,000 years, uh, several thousand years. And why? where did it come from? The idea of the flesh, not the promise. God promised Isaac, God promised Abraham and Sarah, I'm going to give you a son. But they were getting old. So Sarah became impatient, sending Hagar, a younger slave woman, with her husband, and the child was born, and that was Ishmael. Okay? So that's what he, uh, uh, Paul is talking about. Verse 23, His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman, that's Sarah, was born as the result of the promise. I'm going to give you a son. And he did when Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90 years old. Impossible. Salvation is impossible thing for human being. Any birth is impossible thing. But God did it. God promised and God did it. That's the gospel. Do you, do you follow? And I'm um, these things are being taken figuratively. And Paul is using that story to describe the gospel and Judaism and false false teaching, false religion. The woman represents two covenants. Okay, two covenants that God made. One covenant is at Mount Sinai that bears children who are to be slaves. That's the law. God made a covenant with Israel, Israelite and Mount Sinai, and that was through the law. That's through the works, through the religion. And that's Hagar, verse 25. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia. 
and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem, which refers to Judaism, okay? Judaism, which is work of uh, religion of works uh, in Jesus' time because she is in slave, slavery with her children, okay? So Paul is saying, Hagar, Ishmael, that's all uh, covenant that God made through the law. So that's not the gospel. Okay. Verse 26. But the Jerusalem that is above is free. And she is our mother. He's talking about Sarah. He's talking about grace of God. He's talking about the gospel. The promise, right? Verse 27. For it is written, be glad, barren women. You who never bore a child, shout for joy, cry, cry out loud. You who were, born, uh, were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. And this was a prophecy in the Old Testament, which was fulfilled in Jesus, right? So now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, we are like Isaac, children of promise. You know why we are like uh, Isaac? Because Isaac was a miracle child. Father was 100 years old. Mother was 90 years old. In Africa, how, how, like how late women give birth? Up to like 50 years old? Can I just ask you? Pa Pastor Nathan, you heard of African women giving birth like late in their uh, age. How old? Like you're saying? How old, like an African woman who gave a birth late in, in the stage, how old is she? No. no. How old? Like how old? 40? Like, who can give? Around uh, 40, 40, 45. 45? Okay, 45. Yes. But Sarah 45. was... Okay. But Sarah was 90 years old. Huh? And that's, Abraham that's... was 100 years old. And Isaac was born. It's impossible. Yeah, it's impossible. That is why he's a promised child, a miracle child. And Pastor Nathan, you are a miracle child of God. Amen. Amen. You are a miracle. You know why? Amen. Because you are such a hater of God. You are a slave to sin. You are dead to sin. You are dead to God. Haters of God. Enemy of God. Now, you are resurrected, and now you ch Amen. you are a child of God, and you love the Lord. You are such a miracle child. Amen. All of us, all of us Christians, are like Isaac. That makes sense. That's the gospel. Yes, it makes sense. That's the gospel. Verse twenty eight. Now, you brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. God promised us. God has chosen us. At the time, the son born according to flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. And it is same now. That's amazing. Ishmael was like 14 years older than Isaac and who used to like uh, persecuted Isaac. So what did God tell Abraham to do? Expel him, Hagar and uh, Ishmael. Expel him. I'll take care of him, but kick him out of the family. And it is same now. If you are a true child of God, those who do not know the gospel will persecute you. If you preach the gospel, those who do not know the gospel, prosperity preachers will persecute you. Does that make sense? Yes. It says here, it is same now. Two more verses, verse 30. But what does scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son. For the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with a free woman's son. Get rid of it. Get rid of the false gospel from your church. Get rid of prosperity gospel from your, your mind. Get rid of that kind of thing from your church. Preach the truth. Preach the gospel. Preach the, uh, the, uh, the salvation by grace. Salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. 
They may persecute you, but you still have to separate yourself. Get rid of it. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of slave women, but of the free woman. By the covenant that God was made with Abraham, which is the, the, uh, the covenant of grace, through his promise, through faith as a gift, through Jesus on the cross, born of a uh, woman, under the law, redeemed us and adopted us. Now Holy Spirit lives in us. Now we are the children of free women. Amen. We finished chapter four. <laughs> that was fast, but I ask you to go back and read it, understand it. If you have a big picture, your ministry will be standing on good foundation. You need to have a big picture. From Abraham to law to Christ to Reformation to now. You need to have a big picture. And then until Christ returns from creation, you need to have a big picture. It, it is through Christ. I'll take a few questions uh, before we close, if you have any questions, brothers. What is Reformation? Are you talking about Reformation? Okay. Uh, in 16th century, there was only one church, Catholic Church. You know Cath Catholic Church, right? Yes. Catholic Church in Europe, uh, under the Pope, was so corrupted. They were selling salvation, literally selling salvation. They would not preach the word, but everything was tradition. It was just so corrupted. Meaning, if you pay me, you could buy salvation. I know that happens, but the whole church was like that. So true believers reformed against it. And the Protestant church started. So Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli. And that's, mm -hmm. that's like Christian history. That's a big uh, separation between Catholic church and Protestant church, which we are now. Okay. Catholic church still teaches salvation is by grace plus works. works but we protestant we believe salvation is by grace and through faith that works amen. yeah not plus works okay amen thank you yeah my name is danish i want to yes ask yes, yes uh chapter four verse four okay was was uh, Paul talking about the law of nature or was talking about the law of Moses? When the uh, set time had fully come, God sent his son born uh, of, of the woman, born under the law. When we're uh, talking about that whole law of God, of the Old Testament, whole law of God, entire law that was given through Moses in the mountain of Sinai. And that that's what the Judaism is, is right? right? Judaism believe. We need to obey every single law to be saved, right? Salvation is, by, salvation is by obeying the law and Jesus, but we can't do it. So God sent his son under the law so that he would obey everything perfectly and he would give that perfect obedience and righteousness to us when we put our faith in him. Okay? Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah, Thank study you, yeah, study more. Read Galatians. Read transcripts. If you have a solid understanding of this now as young pastors. Halle Pastor Hallelujah, how old are you? How old are you, Pastor? I'm I'm 40 years. 40? Yes. You look so young. Praise God, but 40 is so young. Amen. <laughs> now, I'm saying this, when you're young, if you have a good, solid foundation of the scripture, your whole ministry will be standing upon it. You know why people preach prosperity and all these different things? Because they do not study the scripture. Because they do not. They don't. That's why I ask you to 
get this discipline of waking up in the morning, not just for the class, for you to study the scripture, read the Bible, study scripture, read the transcript to give you some, some understanding and background, background of Galatians. Okay? Build your life and ministry upon found, good foundation. One last question. Anyone else? Yes, it's, it's my amole. Mm -hmm. I'm not yet satisfied of this word, uh, adaption mm. uh, and the redemption. Okay, one more time. Sure. Adaption and the redemption. Okay. Pastor, uh, Amole, please read the transcript number uh, 15 carefully, okay? But redemption is this. It's a slavery word. Let's say you're a slave owned by a master. I come to you, uh, come to your master and pay $1,000 money price and I buy you to set you free. That's redemption, redeeming, redemption. Now, I bought you, so you belong to me, but you are, you're no longer slave. That's what Christ has done for us. He's our redeemer. He bought us. We belong to him. He paid a price. And the, pay, the price was what? His own blood. Now you belong to him, but you're free. Not only now free, but he decided to take you legally as a son. Okay? God decided to take you yeah. as a legal son. And you become son of the father, God. And that's adopting you into the family. Adoption. And these two is what the gospel is. He redeemed you from slavery and he adopted you as a son into his family. Okay? Amen. Amen. Okay. It's an incredible gospel. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Let me you. pray. Yeah. Let me pray. And we have maybe four more classes left. Tell the sisters to come to the class. <laughs> okay. Let me pray. And then well, I'll, uh, I'll let you go. Father, I want to bless you and thank you. What a wonderful gospel that is. God sent his son, born of a woman, under the law, so that he may redeem us from this slavery that we cannot do anything about, that we must die in sin, slave to sin. And yet you came to redeem us through the cross of Jesus Christ. And through the resurrection, we are no longer bound by sin and, and death. But now we are adopted as sons and daughters of living God, of eternal God the Father. And forever and ever, we will be reigning with you. And we will be worshiping you and living for you. And I just pray that, would you bless these uh, uh, African pastors, brothers and sisters, so that they may... Spend time with the Word of God every morning. Enjoying that time. Building their life. Building their foundation. For the glory of Christ, Lord God. In East Africa, they will just continue to grow and mature. And plant a church and build a church that will preach the gospel. Setting people free from the slavery of sin. Slavery of Satan. And bring glory to God and joy to God, Lord God. And may there be such hope in their hearts. And I thank you and bless you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, brothers. Have a blessed week. Yes, Wanaku Panda. <laughs> uh.